Hello, good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar on rethinking emancipation in Latin America and the decolonial project. My name is Julia and I am co-convener of the ASI Working Group on Post and Decolonial Perspectives um, on Development. Um, the ASI Working Group is just a very open group of everyone, not only scholars, but generally people thinking and working on all issues related to post and decolonial um, topics. And where one of part of our activities is organizing um, these online talks um, to give give us the chance to listen to each other's um, work and research findings. So today we have uh, Juan Fernando with us, um, who has um, studied international relations, diplomacy and political sciences um, at the International U University of Ecuador. And currently he's enrolled in the Masters in Global Studies at the University um, of um, Freiburg in Germany. Um, but currently he's um, actually um, joining us from, from Ecuador at a really um, early early time in the morning. So thanks for, for getting up so early. <laughs> um, Juan has uh, worked on issues of um, the construction and reconstruction of knowledges from the South. Um, he's also um, worked um, on education, on questions of education and development especially on critical literacy for sustainable development and also on the topic that he will talk to us about today um, on the question of emancipation and especially of course in the context of Latin America. And today in his uh, talk he will argue that um, after more than 150 years of in independence um, and the emancipation narrative um, it is necessary to start rethinking and ask what emancipation really means. So before we start, um, just a few um, um, details on, on, the, on the technicalities. After Juan's talk, uh, we will have the chance to um, for Q&A and discussion. So there are two options. You can either um, unmute yourself and talk or put um, this at the bottom corner, there's a little chat box where you can put um, your questions. Um, during the talk, we will, I will mute everyone, of course, apart from Juan, so that we don't have any disruptive background noises. Um, and also, I would like to make you aware that we are recording the talk um, and later put it on YouTube. So if you're not comfortable with appearing in the video, then please just keep your camera switched off. So, um, so much for the for the talk um, from my side. Um, over you to to you, Juan, and um, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, um, Julia. And um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I think it's an excellent opportunity to just keep talking about these topics. We had an amazing uh, talk last week about um, global justice. And I think this also helps to keep understanding um, the decolonial project and what decolonial uh, means. So for this, um, I, I have titled this talk, Rethinking Emancipation in Latin America at the Decolonial uh, Project. And I want you to see how I put the title together. First, um, you see how Latin America um, is in, quot in quotation as a way of um, asking what Latin America really means, okay? Where did this idea of Latin America came from? And I think that's really important for the decolonial project. And also, why this, uh, the use of re and de, like re-emerging, decolonize, um, rethink, has been more and more out there in the academic field. Why so important to see things from a different perspective nowadays. What had happened in the region um, that we can already start talking about different perspectives and finally uh, try to figure out a way out of the lineal narrative that so far we have had. So that's why um, I have called this talk Rethinking Emancipation 
uh, in Latin America and the decolonial project to ask what is emancipation, what is Latin America, and especially towards what the decolonial project um, can lead us. So to start, um, I think that I want you to try to understand that we have to see the geopolitical of knowledge and with that uh, to understand that my main goal is not to just rethink emancipation in Latin America, but also to understand the war through the lens of Latin America and through my location in this region. As, uh, as Julia mentioned before, I'm just right now, I'm in Ecuador, I'm doing uh, my research on this topic. And I think that is really important for decolonial studies to see where in the spectrum, the spectrum of knowledge um, we can discuss and start talking. Um, it's important to mention that there's a narrative around power that has created a lot of myths. Um, for example, one of those myths is the discovery of, of America by Cristobal Colón or America Vespucio. And therefore the destruction of the ideas that were before here in this region. So with that said, I want to start um, with this quote. I want to start with this quote. Uh, I want to start with this quote that of Jose Marti. He has a really interesting um, essay about our America, Nuestra America. And this specific part, I think that points out one of the important issues of the colonial legacy. And one of those is the race, the idea of race. How did the other, or how did the colonizers put together the idea of another less important than them? So I really invite you, if you have the opportunity to read uh, this essay of, of Jose Marti. And if you can see, um, he's, he, in the end of this essay, he says, there's no right, uh, racial hatred because there are not races. Low, weak minds working. Um, what he tries to, to say with this um, a specific part is that this idea of race, this idea of uh, mestizos, criollos, of black, of white, was something not ontological, but epistemological. It was something that was created in the region and was, on a way, something that allow the colonizer to colonize better, to conquer better. Okay, so with that said, um, I think that one of the important things to understand the narrative of, uh, of modernity and the narrative of coloniality is to understand um, the cartography. And this is part of an introduction. Where did Europe was before the discovery of America. That's really important. And I think that's the main question. Uh, how Europe was presented uh, during the Renaissance? And where was Asia? And how important is to understand who was in the middle of everything? So now we see, we, we see maps and there is a distribution. And in that distribution, we can understand the relation of power. But before of that, and before that construction of ideas, um, China was in the center. America was not uh, part of the maps and Europe was relegated. And that's the inter interesting part. How with the coming of modernity, of the idea of modernity, everything start changing. So I want you to observe uh, this, this map is a, a Korean map. And as you can, tell, as, as you can see, the draw of Latin America of, or what was not called America yet, isn't the site of the Pacific next to China. And Europe is in the corner, in the left corner. And this is start changing. And this is the narrative that is so important to understand. So with Martin Balsenberg, that he was a monk from Freiburg, he's the first one that using uh, cartographies from Asia, draw Europe in the center. And as you can see on the left, that was the first um, 
apparition of America in cartography. And here's really important to tell that in, in 1492, when Colon arrived to what he thought was some kind of peninsula in Asia, um, he didn't know that that was America. You cannot discover something that you didn't know was there. If you read the letters of Colon, and that's the most important thing, if you read the letters of Colon, he's describing Asia. He's just amazed that um, he found another way to arrive to China or India. And this is because Europe was relegated from all trade in the world. So, as you can see, this idea of where is Europe start changing with the invention of the idea of America until Abraham Ortelius, that is the first one that um, cartographer that created an atlas. And this is the atlas that has been used for several years. When you already see a continent, America as a continent, and next to it, Europe, and then relegated to the right corner, Asia. So how we understand, and when I say we, I say me from this, um, from Ecuador, is that this is the history that has been told. And to be honest, it's really hard to find any other maps that are no these ones that are so common and popular. And that's also hard, and that's part of the decolonial project try to understand that what we thought that was something ontological already set as a true was not a true. There was different visions of the world before and especially of where America stands and what America truly is. And here is really interesting also that in the 15th century or 16th century, with the decision of Pope the Sixth, and that's also the funny part of the um, narrative of modernity, a decision of a Pope uh, was the one that decided that all the territories discovered by the Portuguese and the Spaniards, or, or divide the territories that were already discovered by discover by the Portuguese and the Spaniards, just like that. A whole continent with culture, traditions, um, and already a history going on there was divided by a Pope decision. And you can see there already that that was done, not even, the Pope was not even in the continent. He was in Europe. He didn't have any idea of what he was dividing, but he did through the Tratados de Tordesillas. So that's why the historical narrative that I have heard so far during the school and university is a linear narrative towards the idea of modernity and progress. And with this idea, it established that modernity rise as part of the industrial revolution and as part of the coming of capitalism. But if we see history, modernity and a form of capitalism already rise after 1492. What we have thought that was feudalism in America was already mercantile capitalism. Everything that was being produced in America was being sold to another continent. And this idea of globalization that came with modernity, there was already an interconnection even through uh, the historical relation through slavery between Africa and America, there's a, um, there's a big fluctuation of woods and people between these, um, these continents. So what, what I want to do is to disrupt or somehow disorder this idea of modernity and with that modernity, progress is achieved. Because we have to understand the other side of modernity. And that's what is so important in rethinking um, emancipation, especially rethinking Latin America. That modernity is a coin with two sides. The one is modernity and the other one is coloniality. And that's something that um, we're going to see further. 
So the invention, and you just change a little bit the idea of invention and you have the invasion of America. And there are important questions, who, where, when, and how. And for that, the, the, the different, um, the different historical truths that have been told in America is a reproduction of, a, of epistemological knowledge of, okay, before here there was indigenous people, but were indigenous people the same as white? Did they have the same rights? Or how were they being um, categorized? And categorization is another part of modernity coloniality that is important in the debate. Because there was no way of achieving colonialism without creating the idea of race and sex. So therefore, the idea of race is not ontological, it's epistemological. So the creation of whiteness as something that represent the European and black or indigenous as the other less. So here's where we start seeing the vicious binaries. There's white, so therefore there's something less. It could be white, it could be black, it could be a mestizo, it could be a, a, a criollo. And this is how colonialism was implanted with these ideas. So the vicious binaries were not only a way of controlling people, because you cannot conquer what you think is at the same level that you. Somehow you have to put it in a different level, in a lower level to conquer. That's the only way. And that's what they did here in America. And not only the vicious binaries go towards that, but also if you see on the rise of America, there was the need of creating a second less important or a second less developed America. And the idea of Latin America rise with that. So we have America as, an, as a construction, but then in America, they already have to do a division. An America that was more important, cultural higher as a, as a perspective, but also an America that was not developed, was underdeveloped. So Latin America is not just a way of pointing out certain countries or certain region, but it's a way of also putting in a second place in the same continent, countries that share the same cultural history. So in this part of rethinking emancipation, we have the first struggles for independence. And what is funny is that emancipation was a tool bring by the colonizer. And this tool was presented on a way that the people, or los pueblos, how we call it, can achieve independence and with that end colonialism. But colonialism didn't end with the wars of independence in um, 1822, because it transforms into what we call now, or what the, a group of thinkers call now, the coloniality of power. That means that the same structures that were already implemented during colonialism were transferred to the ones now in power. And if you read, Fran, if you read uh, Franz Fanon, it's, it's really um, sad to see. He has a book called Black Skins, White Masks. And he says that sadly, um, the colonizer, after the colonizer leaves, there's always someone willing to occupy that spot. And those ones that tried to occupy the space of the colonizer once before were oppressed. But 
the group of oppressed of the of, or the block of oppressed it's is not homogeneous so therefore once we had someone new in power there are several groups indigenous people other groups of mestizos maybe that are once again in the same pattern of colonizer colonize so you can see the institutions in latin america after independence after the creation of the nation states after the creation of the nation state there is still groups of people that try to find their way out of the system and why is this is because the the process of emancipation or so-called independence didn't achieve what people was expecting to so can we talk really about or can we say that we have really emancipated if we keep the same structures that create the same relations of oppression inside the states or in the region it's really important to understand that modernity coloniality capitalism and aerocentrism all emerge at the same time and if we still depend of these structures of relation of power so maybe we maybe what we thought was emancipation is not emancipation and in a state of achieving or somehow being part of the system to change it from below is not enough maybe it's not only to reform the system but it's necessary to change the system completely to have a new understanding a different understanding of the one that we already have in touch and in this in this line you can see in the region some inter interesting factors why the decolonial um, thinkers rise from latin america there is different revolutions after the independence in the region in the 19th century we have the cuban revolution zapatistas sandinistas chilean revolution uh, of people that were trying to somehow get to power and change some structures that felt really unfair and with that there is the rise of the theology of liberation i really recommend you to 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 see and to read about the, the, the theology of liberation and with that there is the rise of the philosophy of liberation uh, wrote by enrique dussel and how important this perspective of uh, latin america is still fighting for for somehow a new recognition of different set of groups that were not only were not minorities and that's the important thing to understand there were not minorities where when when the name of america came or took place there was already names in this region um, the people from the center america panama and colombia the cunas called this region abyayala uh, the incas call it tahuantinsuyo uh, in um, the aztecas also had the name so maybe there is a history that we can go back and read it and reread it again with the with what has happened through all these two centuries of independence because the important breaking point for the region was independence the creation of the nation state but that breaking point if we analyze through the line of history has not changed the different structures of oppression so you also have the indigenous uprisings in the 1990 uh, in bolivia in ecuador and you have also nowadays new political powers in the region so if we see emancipation as a tool and if we think that modernity bring progress where why there is still these uprisings these new political structures, the so-called uh, socialists of the 21st century, why people has tried to change the constitution to recognize that in the nation state, they can be different, they can um, exist different languages, different cultures, different uh, histories. And just to finish the, the, the presentation, because I'm running out of time, there's also the rise of 
a different perspective that was not part of the colonizer. For example, the idea of Suma Causai, of Buen Vivir, that we already discuss, uh, discussed that in, in, in another conference, in another talk. How important is to start using this to understand the reality that is taking place now. So last, as the decolonial project or um, towards where the decolonial project can take us and we have to see really, we have to be really pragmatic in terms of institutions. For example, we have the University Amantawasi that is wrongly called the indigenous university because it's not a university just for indigenous people, but it's a university that is creating a new way of understanding things a different way of understanding things, a different narrative, a different historical nar narrative. And it came from this idea of a pluriversidad, that the university has not to be, as the historical process, just linear. It should be pluri, pluri-university. Also, what, lay, what uh, lays beyond the idea of Latin America, and that's also important, it's, it's not only about changing the name that's gonna fix everything, but understanding that the idea of Latin America was a construction, was not something that was there before, but was an invention that was imposed to the people of, of the region. And therefore the idea of Latin America is, uh, is not only, is not represent geographical terms, but the ideological terms. Latin America as the, as the less other in America. But these, uh, and it's important that the loss of hegemony also allow us to see beyond just a Latin America towards or, or um, Latin America is not just South America, Central America, it could be more. Also the rise of epistemologies of the South, if you read Bonaventura de Sousa, um, you have important on why everything that is rising from the South has a different meaning and why it's rising now. And uh, finally, the path to the pluri, to understand Pluri knowledge, pluricultural, to see that there's not just one linear way of seeing things, but there are different ways of seeing things. So if we rethink emancipation, there's not only one idea of emancipation, but there's different ideas of emancipation. And with that, and because um, I already passed five minutes, I thank you all for listening to this presentation. And also I invite you to see or to rethink emancipation in your own environment and perspective. Thank you, Julia. Thanks, Juan, uh, for this really interesting talk. And I think it was a great roundup and mapping of, of, of power in the, con con in the contextualization of, of emancipation, the question of, you know, emancipation of what and for whom and, um, you know, who who, who decides and who speaks. And I think the, the fact that it's so hard actually to find a non-Eurocentric map um, already speaks for itself, actually. I, I guess it doesn't really need much further, um, further ex explanation. So I, I would invite everyone now to um, join the discussion um, ask, and ask questions to, to Juan or give your own um, experiences, maybe your own experiences of emancipation, as Juan said, in, in your own context. Um, so, um, as I said, if you'd like to just maybe um, put in the chat box that you have a question and then um, I'll just keep a list of speakers. So to give you maybe a few moments to think um, of a question, I just kick off. Um, I liked it, um, Juan, that you said, you know, um, change the university and change the, I, I, re I really like the idea of not, you know, not having the university, but the pluriversity. Um, and, and there's a lot of discussions about decolonizing the university, especially as an institution that is very much in many contexts very much the neoliberal institution that is very much targeted to the production of um of certain measurable um knowledges or certain knowledges that are um yeah that are that are fit to the to the indicators 
I was wondering, because I know you've been studying in, in very different contexts, you've been studying in, um, in Ecuador, in Germany, um, but also in India and um, South um, Africa. Um, so I wondered whether you have seen any, any different um, practices in these different institutions. Um, yeah, and how that is actually put, maybe put into practice. So the yes. the decolonization of of institutions that that produce knowledge about the other in that sense. You know, yeah, it's really interesting to see that um, I had the opportunity, as you know, to study not only Germany but in South Africa and in India. And um, for example, and that's how knowledge works. Um, when I was in South Africa, uh, you have uh, different institutes of African studies. And we were in a talk called um, Decolonizing the Postcolonial University. And one of the important things, and I, I really th think I mentioned you this before, is that language, language plays an important role on decolonizing. Mm -hmm. So why is so important to have an institute, for example, of African studies, not as African studies, but as studies? <laughs> Because when Hegel wrote the phenomenology of the spirit, it was not German studies. It was considered as universal knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's the big difference between uh, Europe or, or India or Africa or Latin America. And that's a huge difference. So why is it important to keep, for example, vernacular language? And in Oceania, they are doing a great work on that. Um, and, when, and, and, and going on in this line, in South Africa, they were calling for a change of the structure of the university because you cannot understand the war through theories that were created in an environment that is not the same of the environment that you are in the moment. So I know, um, and many people will criticize this, but I, I know Foucault is great. I know um, Adam Smith and Marx are great, but they were trying to explain their re explain their reality from the perspective of a Europe perspective. So when you try to put that ideas into place in Latin America, something starts to like is not working on. So when you see, for example, the lumpen proletariat of Marx, Andres Cobar had to create a new term in Latin America to, to not not to explain the lumpen proletariat because there was not that idea here, but a lumpen bourgeoisie a bourgeoisie that was not working for the sake of achieving economic development. And it's the same in South Africa. This idea of lumpen bourgeoisie of Marx, that they have nothing to do with change or revolution or anything, in Africa, those are the groups, and it's called by Fanon, those are the groups that really create change in society. It's not the working class that is joining together to try to fight and create a new history or a new perspective are those ones that are more oppressed and relegated. So that's why I think we have to think of the pluri university. Mm -hmm. And once we achieve that, and this is this project of the University of Amantasin was really categorized as, as an indigenous university. No, it's, it's a university that wants to create knowledge from Latin America for the world or from what Avia Yala, not Latin America, because they they don't use this word, this invention. They prefer to use Avia Yala. Okay, Avia Yala is the way they call the continent. So, how to create knowledge from Avia Yala to the rest of the world? So, yeah, I think, and also the same happens in India. If you are a study um, sociology in India and you go to England, they say that you are an anthropologist. <laughs> So you, it, it changed a little bit. I don't know if it's, the, if it's the other way around, but you see how, because the object or the subject is, is modified mm -hmm. from where are you, or, or from where are you seeing it? So I think that's the main, one of the first steps that we have to do, especially in, in the university sphere. It's good to know, it's, good, it's really good to know different theories, to understand different thinkers, but also to have a way of creating something um, that is local or is local is somehow local but thinking on the global scale 
Okay, I think um, there's a question. Um, okay. Um, it says, I agree on the view provided by Juan, but I would like to know what kind of academic and institutional efforts Ecuador is implementing to promote the so-called decolonial turn. Um, it might be interesting um, information to, to share, says uh, Jorge Leo. Well, as you, as, as, as you know, um, in Ecuador, since the year, since the year 2008, a lot of a lot of things changed because the constitution of the of the country changed. And in this constitution, there was uh, the creation of new terminologies and the recognition of groups of people that were before not recognized, indigenous people, mestizos, um, mulatos, these kind of categories of group of people that were somehow forget it by colonialism. And even though that in the formal set of the universities, um, Flaxo, for example, or um, Universidad Andina, they try to think beyond um, the normal structure. They keep using European traditions to understand Latin American history. <laughs> but I can tell that there has been a shift, a strong shift, especially because of the fights that have happened in this, in this country. For example, in the indigenous uprising, um, and with that, the creation of the University Amantawasi, and also the different narratives that are um, trying to cope with the idea of Summa Causae. So even there's people that is trying to understand the Summa Causae uh, from the perspective of Summa Causae, not translating it to Buen Vivir or to uh, Good Living, that will be the translation into English, but keeping it in the original language and trying to get closer to what these mean. So in terms of the university, I think there has been some advances, um, but we are still, or we still need to create more or relate more to this decolonial project. There's a amazing professor, Catherine Wash. She just published a book on, um, on decoloniality and she has really, really put all the effort, even that she's part of a private university, um, that she has put all the effort to change the curriculum. So we start from there. We, need, we first need to change the curriculum, not only teaching Foucault, but also teaching indigenous traditions and knowledge as part of the way, or as part of changing your mindset. I would actually like to pick up on on the term um, indigenous knowledge because that's I've heard that discussed critically at, at times also. Um, of course, in comparison to the you know again the binary lo local knowledge, global knowledge, which, which again has this you know the the Eurocentric or the Euro European knowledge is the global obviously, and then have your you have all the indigenous knowledges that are to some extent local yeah. and not as universally <laughs> applicable but also the second point in terms of indigenous knowledge that um you know to what extent can there be in truly indigenous knowledge if you know everything is somehow um interlinked and interdependent in the in this like global production of, of yes. knowledge or knowledges in the plural maybe. And I, I think that's a great question and, and that's why for example uh, when people start talking about the uh, Amanta Wasi University they put it on this framework that that university is for indigenous people <laughs> and they're, they're the binary the, bi the binary <laughs> goes one again you, ha you have the somehow white university and therefore you need to have a indigenous university. Mm -hmm. But that's true, we shouldn't call it just, or it's not proper to, to say indigenous knowledge, but knowledge. Knowledge is. It is knowledge. Uh, I think the differentiation at the moment is important because before we start uh, interconnecting the different paths, we have to analyze them separately and pointing out from where or why we need to call that 
different than the normal knowledge. And not to criticize, in, it's not a way of criticizing indigenous knowledge, but it's a way of criticize um, knowledge or the structure of, or the power of knowledge, the matrix of power in knowledge. So when I say indigenous knowledge, it's not a way of um, putting like as the as a site, but saying that there is a historical process and there is a narrative of emancipation and there is a narrative of knowledge that has created this structure that has led us to nowhere. Already last week, uh, Vanessa already told us we have to find solutions or why we cannot find solutions to fix all the problems that we have put us into. And it's the same with knowledge. There has been a different path for knowledge mm -hmm. because the narrative and, 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 and all the ideas and all the theoretical approaches so far has not helped social science or science in general to create a better feeling of living and community. So I'm trying to give something back. When I'm saying indigenous knowledge, I'm trying to recognize that it was born there and now it's understanding in the, in the general spectrum of knowledge. But you, you're completely right. We, we always, that's what we have in our, in our mindset. We always have this uh, binary. It's, it's really, really bad. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I think it's really, I guess it's probably like a human thing to try and understand things that you put them in, in, in opposites. Um, so I was, I was, uh, and everyone, please feel free to, to join in um, the conversation. So, so not as we are having, you know, having um, a dialogue. <laughs> um, just want um, to mention something to, to everyone. Uh, this idea of emancipation came to me because I already had very clear what emancipation means. But for me, everything changed when I was um, in Spain in the um, Palace of the King. And in the main room, they have this uh, amazing, amazing painting on the roof, on the, on the top of the roof. And it's one of the most important places of the palace. And there they say we have put together all the cultural identities of Spain and all what Spain means and everything. So you have people dancing flamenco and stuff like that. But when I was there, they asked me, where are you from? And I was like, I'm sure I'm not there because I'm not from Spain per se, so I'm sure I'm not there. And they no, no, tell me, where are you from? And I say, well, I'm from Ecuador. And they're yeah, you are there. You are represented there. So they have this uh, <laughs> painting or this specific part where there was uh, this indigenous, not indigenous because they have this red thing, just giving the hand to, to the Spanish in, in, in terms of yourself, in, you, are, um, you are saving me. <laughs> and I was, okay, so we still have these structures going on outside the territories. Have we really emancipated somehow? Have we really have created a different narrative? And I was like, maybe we haven't. And that's one of the main issues why people say, oh yeah, I'm there. So I think that's, that's part of also, where do you stand and why do you talk about these specific things? Do you think um, that, you know, the argument you're making is, is also applicable is is it particular to you know Latin America or do you think it's the it's the same argument basically applicable to any um, formerly colonized countries? I think we we share a lot with Africa. It's different in terms of of India or Asia that they were also colonies, but the relation between them and the colonizers um, was uh, was different. But in terms of Africa and, and Latin America, we, we share a lot of things. And uh, there is a talk of, of Walter Mignolo when he's reading something that was written uh, in Africa about what did the colonialism did. And he said, if you change Africa from Latin America, the rest is just the same. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. the same, it's applicable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think uh, Fran, Franz Fanon, even that he was from Martinique and he was fighting in Africa, he shared um, this way of seeing the colonizer and the damage that was or was done by colonialism. And that's why it's so important, even that in, in Latin American um, decolonial group, 
you have Enrique Dussel, you have Aníbal Quijano, you have uh, Walter Mignolo, they always refer also to, to Franz Fanon. They, mm -hmm. they always try to go back there. So I think it's because we share a lot of things. There are a lot of things in common. Are there any questions from the from the others? <laughs> Please don't be shy. Just you know, you can unmute yourself and just chip in the conversation. It's not a dialogue. It's a <laughs> holy log <laughs> or the pluri pluriversation. <laughs> if we want to use that. That's that's um, it. <laughs> I um I I also wanted to come back on um you know, the question of languages, because you talked about, you know, vernacular languages and um, we exchanged about that before. Um, and also the, um, I mean, Fanon writes about, but Fanon, yeah, Fanon writes about that too, the, about the, the colonization of mind and um, um, Mugi van Tiongo writes about that. But, you know, for me as a, obviously, European, um, I can only, you know, read in the, in the colonial languages. So if I want to, you know, access these indigenous knowledges um, or these, these writings, then to, to a certain extent, they, they have to be, um, you know, in the colonial language. Um, and um, while we, for a, um, within the Adi there, there have been a lot of discussions about, you know, we we have to obviously overcome this, this bubble of Eurocentric knowledge production and reach out to others, yet um, the, and then again, that's a question of, of you know, academic um, merit that the, the knowledge that is um, published in high impact journals um, these are always journals that are in North America or in Europe, the ones that, you know, do something for your CV. <laughs> and again, they are published in English. Um, yeah, not, not even in Spanish so much, but mostly in English, actually. Um, so, you know, for me, like as an individual researcher, as an individual scholar, I always wonder, you know, how can I reach out how can i move beyond because i i actually notice when i go to conferences when i go to workshops um they're always very talented people there and very critical thinkers and but it tends to be the same people and it tends to be the same ideas we're kind of bouncing around and i really want to you know move beyond my own bubble bubble of knowledge production but i find it actually really hard to try and find these people that, you know, give me these, maybe some other critical ideas to. But that, that's, that's really important in terms of what is to translate or what we should mm -hmm. translate. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about translation is because we talk that what was written in a different language is important. So there's a lot of knowledge, not only um, not, written in, not written in English, but for example, Hindi, um, mm -hmm. different, different languages that are really important, but we are still focusing or we are still really Eurocentric and also US centric. Mm -hmm. English has become so important mm -hmm. to communicate. But I'm not saying that we can change that. I mean, at, at, as we speak, basically, you know, I mean, exactly. we are not, this way we know is not. Um... <laughs> I, I have always said that I don't feel that comfortable speaking um, in English, but it's a way of. Uh, passing ideas mm -hmm. but I think we also have to give importance and for example you were talking about uh, Thiago Nolo um, and he writes he most of his books he writes in his vernacular language and then those books are so important that are translated to English mm -hmm. and we can discuss about those books but if we, if we don't start using these kind of languages we're gonna lose those and there is a way of understanding things in the original language that mm -hmm. you cannot achieve through translation. And it's mm -hmm. really hard. One mm -hmm. thing is, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this because German is really hard to talk. But when you read Marx, not the translation of Marx, but Marx in German, you have a different way of understanding it, of how he was trying to explain. 
Mm. And it was so important, that book, that was translated not only to English, but to Spanish and to different languages. And we have to do the same because we have to give value to other or to the idea of plural knowledges. We have to give value. And when we try to create this uni university, that is one direction, we enter to this debate of language. Mm. And that's why the Center of Studies, Center of African Studies, the Center of Latin American Studies, they try to use the origin, like the or Spanish or a little bit of, um, for example, Quechua, they try to use it. But that not should be just in the, um, it should be in the mainstream, not should be only in the, in the site. We should bring this, those kind of debates to the mainstream to talk about them, to make them important. And it's the only way that we can reconstruct what was already constructed in a really directional, I'm not against Europe per se, but in a really set of mind. We are mm -hmm. using the same authors. If you see um, thesis of, of um, bachelor's students, they use almost the same bibliography. If they're gonna talk about something related to uh, psychology or something or social science, you see the same books. Mm -hmm. And they are different. When I was in South Africa, I was presenting to a new bibliography that I never thought, and the same in India. Mm -hmm. It was a way of trying to learn, to unlearn, first trying to learn what I was already learning, and then to learn again and learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. And Spivak talks a lot about this, how we should learn and unlearn. Um, and those kind of books also give a different sense of, of this idea of emancipation and also this idea of what really decolonial thinking means. So if we, do, if we don't do that, or we think everything we still see, if we keep seeing towards America in terms of USA and Europe as the center of knowledge, we, 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 we are not debating. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's no debate. Well, I think, but you know, as you say, the I think that, that that has to be a process that actually comes from within, from within the institutions, because you, you know, as a bachelor student, you tend to, you know, somehow assume what is good academic practice or what is expected in academia, and you just you just copy it in the same we're, way. We're replicating. It's impossible to publish in an, not impossible, it's really hard to publish in an important journal, journal, the ones that count in your CV, something that is not theoretical accepted, or that sounds like, not magic, but something come from, not theory, not hard theory, what they call hard theory. Well, so, something that is not positivist and to that. Yeah. And that's, that's the issue. And that's mm -hmm. really the issue. So we keep seeing new journals appearing when they want to listen to these narratives, these different narratives, and they are open to the perspective. But these journals are not as important as others. So they don't reach as much people or audience as the others did. So what we are doing is just replicating knowledge. Mm -hmm. we, have, we are lost in the debate of liberalism and um and politics of thinking from Hobbes and, uh, and all of that but there's a different way of doing politics and there's a different way of understanding um these kind of issues <laughs> but uh, it's hard to bring yeah. that to the fore right <laughs> so are there we have one or two more minutes so is there any any question or any comments uh, from anyone that you would like to, to bring in? Everyone is really shy today. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's okay. Because if if not, um, I would I would close the session. Um, thank Juan for this really insightful um, talk. Um, we will put. Um, the talk online so it can be rewatched um, and shared um, and I'm sure if you have any any questions um, you think of this afternoon or this evening um, just get in touch and I'll be happy to to put yeah. you in touch with Juan or forward, forward your questions or comments.
So maybe there, there's a lot of to think. There's a lot of just seeing what Latin America means and just that there's a lot of to, to process. And uh, But I think this has to give a new spark to the debate. That's... Um, that's the thing about re and d and and I think the challenge is actually not to not only to deconstruct because the deconstruction is is easier than the reconstruction yeah. you have to you know what's the what's the alternative to the um, yeah to the critique um, thank you again and thank you all for 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 joining and if you have any questions just as uh, Julia Men, send it to her, put it in the YouTube video that they will up, upload it. I will be more than happy that just debate about this or share um, articles about this topic. Yeah, so it's important to keep the conversation going, as you said. So let's, let's try and do that. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, Juan, and have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.